Church, I'm so glad to be with you today. Uh, looking forward to, to speaking with you. We are going to uh, start a new series today. That series is entitled Jesus Uncensored. If you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and take it out, open it up, or turn it on as the case may be. Matthew chapter 12. Um, we're going to read a pretty good section there. We're going to start in verse 22 and go through verse 37. So Matthew chapter 12, head on over to verse 22. A couple of things I want to let you know about before we jump in. First of all, uh, continue to thank you, those who are part of our congregation, for your continued generosity. Um, if you are watching or you are here today and you have been affected financially because of COVID-19, we are working diligently to come alongside of families who have been affected by the pandemic so that you can be supported during this season. If that's you, please let us know. Um, for those of you who have not been affected financially or you can still give even if you have been affected financially, thank you for your generosity. I just want to tell you a couple of things that have been happening. One of those is that this week I had an opportunity to meet virtually with some of our church planters. Um, church, Your church continues to start new churches all around the city. And this week we found out that one of the churches we're coaching and helping out down in the southeast part of the city actually had an opportunity to have a building granted to it. And so they are now starting a second church on Galveston Island. And so uh, we're seeing multiplication and movement happen in the city, even in the midst of a pandemic uh, through these just incredible work that these planters are doing. Church, thanks for being generous. That's what I want to tell you. We're trying to use the dollars that you're giving faithfully to see that the gospel is moving forward, that the kingdom is expanding here in our city and even beyond. Thanks so much for doing that and trying to come alongside. So if you can give in this season, we gratefully and graciously appreciate it. Uh, you can give hnw.org slash give. Or you can give uh, through our app, or you can give through the receptacles on your way out today. Next, today, as part of this series, uh, Jesus Uncensored, our hope is that the words that Jesus speaks that are sometimes a little shocking will actually move in our hearts to remind us of just how good God has been to us through Jesus. So we set a goal at the beginning of the school year that we would share the gospel 10,000 times. A pandemic came, kind of interrupted all these crazy things that we wanted to do. So this is, we're, we're, we're trying to change our tactics, but still stay true to what we believe that God wants us to do. So we are asking 100 adults to share their testimony on social media. So this is what we'd like to ask you to do. Either film a short video of yourself speaking into the camera, sharing your salvation story, or that you would write it out and then post it on social media. If you don't have social media, that's okay. You can just send it to us and we can look for a way to highlight that. But we're looking for 100 adults to do that because we know that if 100 adults share their testimony online, people will watch that, engage with that, and we can get way down the road towards our goal of sharing the gospel 10,000 times this year. So, this is what we'd like to ask you to do. Do that today if possible, you know, this week at the latest. Hashtag it, my salvation story. And if you're part of our community, you might even see some folks already posting those today and, uh, and getting those out there. So we want you to do that and then to share that and then just to, to use that as a conversation starter so that people can hear about the goodness of our God and who Jesus is. So hope that you will join us in that. Hashtag it, my salvation story. And let's see what God does with that. All right. I am going to uh, pray over us. I'm going to read Matthew 12, verses 22 through 37, and then we'll get started here today. Would you please join me as I pray for the, the preaching of God's word? Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace. And God, we pray, we ask that today, as we open your word, as we preach your word, Lord, as we, as we hear your word, that you would use your word to, to speak to hearts to rescue people. Lord, that no matter what they've experienced, no matter where they are, that, that you would change whatever direction they're in, Lord, and bend them towards you. God, that you would draw them towards you. And Father, we pray if there's people in this room or watching online who have yet to say yes to you, that today would be the day. Father, if there are people here who have already said yes to you, but they are out of step with the Holy Spirit, that today you would get them back in step with the Spirit, Lord. Let us walk with you. Let us hear from you. Let us be convicted and encouraged, comforted and challenged, Lord. Let us hear today. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew 12, starting in verse 22. 
Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him. That's Jesus. And he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed. And they said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. This is the word of the Lord. So as we start this series today, Jesus Uncensored, we're talking about the unforgivable sin. Did you see it there in verses 32, 33, that Jesus says there's something that you can do that will not be forgiven in this age or the next. So being the ever investigative reporter that I am, I hopped on social media this week and I said to my friends and my circle of relationships, what have you heard across your lifetime about the unforgivable sin? And unsurprisingly, there are many comedians in our presence. So, some of you said things like, liking candy corn is an unforgivable sin. Wearing white after Labor Day, unforgivable. Some of them, I will say, got a little personal. I noticed somebody went below the belt, said cheering for the Cowboys. Wow, felt that one. Uh, Pineapple on pizza, talking bad about Texas was mentioned. Somebody even said, if you use cottage cheese instead of ricotta in your lasagna, unforgivable. (laughs) Then they started to get a little more serious. They said, I've noticed that according to my Facebook feed, that if I vote for the wrong person, even though the people who say this are Christians, that they see that as unforgivable. And then we got into the theological, talking about that unforgivable sin there in verse 32. Now, This is what they had heard, not necessarily what they had read, but what they had heard. When I said, what have you heard about the unforgivable sin? Some folks said suicide, that they had heard over the years that if you take your own life, that that can't be forgiven. Now, there's a couple of different circles of thought on that. One of those stems from the ancient teaching from the Catholic Church that suicide is unforgivable. That comes from the idea that if you take your own life, you do not have the opportunity to receive last rites. And if you don't have the opportunity to receive last rites, then you can't be forgiven. There's also been sort of a a mindset in certain Protestant circles that if you take your own life, It's unforgivable because you did not have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness before you died. But but that's not what's here in this passage. Uh, Some of the other ones that that we heard from that were a little more theological in nature, uh, somebody wrote, I've never actually heard this, but the way that I've seen it lived out leads me to believe that many Christians think homosexuality is the unforgivable sin. The way that we treat those who say that they are homosexual is often an indicator that the church has believed historically that that is unforgivable. But that's that's not what this scripture says. Another person gave me one I'd never heard before that was taking the Lord's Supper without first confessing sin was unforgivable because of what Paul says when he writes that if you do so, you eat and drink judgment upon yourselves. 
And then finally, a couple of folks said, well, you know, I was always taught that if you took the Lord's name in vain, and they were talking specifically about cussing, that if you did that, that was unforgivable. But of course, that verse that we read, verses 32, 33, really doesn't reference any of those things. Now, some folks who have been in church a little longer said that they had always heard that the unforgivable sin was rejecting Christ. If you reject Christ, then you can't be forgiven. And while I certainly agree with that statement on its face, that if you reject Christ, then you cannot be forgiven, I wasn't sure that that's exactly what's happening here, at least not initially in verses 32 and 33. So I want to talk about that today. What is the unforgivable sin? So we have to look, I think, at the context. What's happened? Jesus has just cast out a demon. There was this demon that's inside this individual. They can't speak. Um, And Jesus comes along and he casts the demon out. Now, after Jesus casts out the demon, what happens? The Pharisees, that sort of hyper-conservative sect of the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin, those folks look at that and they say, he's only able to do that because he's drawing power from the devil. So kind of think about witchcraft type tropes that maybe you've heard before, this idea that they've drawn in this dark power and they're able to do dark things. But Jesus says, that's crazy talk. That's not what's happening here. I'm able to do this, not because I'm drawing power from the devil. He even uses that phrase that you probably have heard attributed to Abraham Lincoln, a house divided against itself cannot stand, right? He says, if I'm drawing power from the devil, I wouldn't be casting out demons. But that's what they think. And so in that context, Jesus then comes along and says, if you say this in this moment, that what I've done is evil, you're headed towards the unforgivable sin. You see, in verse 32, Jesus is even clear that he says, blasphemy against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Now, you you already know this, right? Because Peter famously denied that he even knew who Jesus was three times and is forgiven, right? And really, if we look back in the pages of Scripture, we see that people often did very offensive things towards Jesus, and yet he continued to offer and extend grace and forgiveness. But Jesus has this interesting distinction. He says, every blasphemy against the Son of Man will be forgiven. However, however, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And then he says in verse 32, either in this age or the age to come. What is it about seeing the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, and calling it evil? What is it about that that is unforgivable? I don't know that we can honestly fully know or understand. There's just not enough there in the text for us to truly definitively know. But I do believe that the unforgivable sin is this sense of hardness to the Spirit, a hardness where you are so turned against God that you attribute the work of the Spirit to the devil. Now, we know that there are people in our lives that we've seen, maybe even some of us sitting in this room or watching here today, who have come to the point where we have hardened our heart against the Spirit of God to a point that we are closing our lives off to any supernatural work of Jesus. Now, there seems to be kind of a weird thing happening here. That if you are still in a place where you will publicly ridicule Jesus, that apparently you're still open to him working. However, if you move to a place where you are so hard that you've cut your heart off, then you cannot be forgiven. You moved beyond that. It's sort of that old atheist idea, there is no God and I hate him sort of thing that's at play here. Charles Spurgeon gives a, a pretty interesting take on it. He writes this. Here is a solemn warning, referring to this verse, for the slanderous Pharisees, the sin of reviling the Spirit of God and imputing his work to Beelzebub is a very great one and in fact, so hardens the heart that men who are guilty of it never repent and consequently are never forgiven. Our Lord let his opponents see whither they were drifting. They were on the verge of a sin for which no pardon would be possible. We must be very tender in our conduct towards the Holy Ghost, for his honor has a special guard set about it by such a solemn text 
is this. Spurgeon says that Jesus is warning them. If you become so hard to the spirit, Jesus says, then you'll never be forgiven because if you are looking at the work of God and calling it evil, you're headed down that path to where your heart will be so hardened that you'll never be able to repent. In other words, it's not simply the face value act of speaking ill of the spirit. It's moving to a place where your blasphemy has hardened your heart past that heart of flesh towards the heart of stone so that you cannot respond to God. So that act will keep you from responding to Jesus and his grace, and that act will keep you from salvation. So yes, some of us had the semi-right idea, right? That it's rejecting Christ, but it's a little more technical than that. It's hardening our heart to the point that we are unable to do so. Now, some of us right now have heard that, and we're wiping our brow with relief, right? We're saying, well, that's not me. I've responded to the gospel. I've said yes to Jesus. I'm in an okay place. Others of us right now might actually be shifting in our seats a little bit, whether we're here or watching online and saying, I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Maybe I am moving to a place where I'm hardening my heart. Now, the good news is, if you're listening to this now, you can still respond, right? You could still say yes to Jesus. But if you're feeling uneasiness, hang with me. But I would also say that if you just wiped your brow in relief and you said, hey, everything's great, also hang with me because I think that there is more to this passage. You see, if we turn the page and head down to verse 33, Jesus keeps talking. Yeah, we're going to learn a new word today, maybe for many of us, the word pericope. Pericope is a section of scripture that is all one story or telling. And you see, the story doesn't end at verse 32, even though in many of our Bibles, there's a heading that drops in right there. But Jesus kept talking. And so in verse 33, he just keeps going and he now begins to say, now this isn't just about eternal condemnation and about the refusal of forgiveness, there's also another layer to it. So we're gonna move from that unforgivable sin now to a subtle shift, a subtle shift that Jesus makes. I think it's interesting that this person, or this sin rather, that Jesus warns about is something that he warns against to religious people and specifically religious leaders. You see, I think that if you go back and you read the New Testament, you see the people that Jesus is hardest on aren't the people that we as churchgoers tend to be hardest on. Jesus is hardest on people like us, the people who are religious, who think that they already know what God wants. That's who Jesus is hard on. And so I want us to see, I think, that Jesus is not speaking only solely about blasphemy of the Spirit, but I'm going to make up a term here. I'm going to say he's also speaking about mockery of the Holy Spirit. Not just blasphemy, but also mockery of the Spirit. I'm a preacher, so I'll speak directly about preachers, but I think the principle is transferable. You see, I think that there's a real danger for anybody who's had any sort of success in ministry to become hyper cynical, particularly people in the tribe where I grew up theologically, there's a tendency among us to look at individuals doing church or ministry differently and to run to the position where we then say, you can't do it that way. That's wrong. And we begin to mock it. Even in our own city, in our own city, there are pastors who are not part of the tribe that raised me theologically, and they become sort of a soft and easy target for people who are in churches like us to make fun of and to say, that's not real ministry. Now, the funny part about it is, is I know people who are part of those churches, and they seem to be people who love Jesus, who believe in Jesus, who exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, and yet, for some reason, we become comfortable with mockery. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about discernment. 
The scripture is clear that we need to be able to discern clearly when people are teaching things that are not truthful, that are outside of the bounds of what the scripture teaches. That's not what I'm talking about right here. But what I am talking about is a critical spirit that begins to arise within the heart of those who are believers to a point that they almost harbor a disdain for those who are different from them theologically. I see this happening more and more, it feels to me, particularly in our current cultural moment. Now, I want to be clear. I don't think that this is something that only leaders do. I think religious people can do this too. In fact, I think that the scripture speaks about this category of mocking the spirit, just using different terms. One of those phrases might be grieving the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Just don't make the Holy Spirit sad. In other words, the Spirit of the living God, alive, living in you, you can act in such a way that you make the Spirit saddened. Or what about 1 Thessalonians? You, you know this one, right? Pretty short, but using the image of a fire in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul says, do not quench the Spirit. So aside and apart from grieving the Spirit, we could also quench the Spirit. Now, I want to be clear about this. This does not mean that you now lose the Holy Spirit, and this is huge. So please pay attention. This is huge. Many of us believe once we've received the Holy Spirit, now, well, I'm good, I'm, I'm going to heaven, everything's over, and we then begin to live a life that is careless towards the concept of grieving, of quenching, of mocking the work of the Spirit. You can do that and still have full forgiveness, of course. However, you will not have the abundant, rich, full life that God intended for believers to have. This is the same way it is in my house, right? I mean, I can say whatever I want to to my wife. You're not going to leave me. I mean, we made a vow, right? But are we going to talk to each other? I mean, now that's an entirely different matter. But this is the way that you can handle the Spirit. You can quench the Spirit because you start to mock the work of the Spirit that you see in other places, or the Spirit prompts you, and you so put that, that prompting off that the Spirit goes from a flame down to just a smoldering ember, or you act in such a way of disobedience or mockery that the Spirit is grieved. You see, you may still be forgiven, but you are not experiencing the full life. You're not at taking advantage of the grace that God has shown you through his spirit. And you worsen this when we do the thing that Jesus refers to in verse 32, that we call the things of the Lord evil. Now, here's another twist, not mentioned explicitly in this passage, but I think absolutely grounded in the concepts here. I think that we also quench the spirit grieve the spirit, mock the spirit, when we call things that are religious in, a, in appearance, but do not have the spirit good. In other words, we look at things that look like church, but the Holy Spirit is not in them or on them, and we say that those things are good. And I would say that in the 21st century in the United States, this might be a larger danger. I'm a preacher, so I'll stick with preachers. Look at what Jesus does in verse 33. So he's continuing on. He's talking about the Holy Spirit and talking about how the Spirit works. And then he switches to the metaphor of fruit. Verse 33, he says this, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. In other words, Jesus says, if you want to know what kind of tree you have, you look at the fruit. He seems to say, if you want to know what sort of spirit is in or on the, the voice to whom you are listening, look at the fruit. Years ago, we moved to Houston, moved into our house, and the Mitchum family gave us a housewarming gift. They gave us a very tiny Meyer lemon tree. And so I enjoy gardening, trying to grow things. So I put it in a pot and started to tend to this Meyer lemon tree. And after a few years, it was a pretty good size. We got a pretty big pot for it. And it was producing fruit. And I was excited about that. 
Hurricane Harvey came along in 2017 and killed my Meyer lemon tree. Flooded it basically, just got so much water that it died. And then some winds came along and man, it just snapped and blew over. And so the end of my lemon tree. Well, so the next year, spring comes along, 2018, and I'm looking at the lemon tree pot, thinking, what am I going to do with this? And I noticed that a tiny shoot was coming up out of the soil. So Joy and I kind of had this debate, you know, what, what do we think this is here? Do, is this just a weed that's blown into the pot, or is this the lemon tree coming back? We had no clue. So for two years, I tended a mystery plant. Wondering what's going to happen. And this year, 2020, the mystery plant started to bear fruit. And lo and behold, lemons. Right? Got the lemon tree, right? It comes back. So that photo you saw, that was actually from this morning. The lemon tree making its way back. I didn't know what the tree was until I saw the fruit. Now this is why I think personally that Paul uses the phrase fruit of the Spirit. Now, Jesus never used that phrase, but in Galatians 5, when Paul uses that personally, I believe he is hearkening back to this conversation in Matthew chapter 12. And he's saying, remember when Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit is an indicator of what's happening and what God is doing? And then Jesus talked about the fruit, showing you know what kind of tree you have based on the fruit. Paul then uses the phrase, fruit of the Spirit. So I think he's just tying back into Jesus' teaching in Galatians 5. And he then says, right, he lists off the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says, if you have the Holy Spirit in your life, then you will see these things. So back to what I was talking about. Whenever we look at religious voices and we say that they're good whenever there's no fruit of the Spirit on them. In the United States, in the 21st century, many of us are attracted to voices, particularly preachers, who are strong, bold, confident, sure. Let me ask you a question. Is confidence a fruit of the Spirit? It's not on the list, is it? Now, I want to be clear. Nothing wrong with confidence. I think that if you're walking with the Lord, you will have a supernatural confidence. You'll still be humble, but you will be sure of the fact that God is with you. However, I believe that there are many voices in our world, particularly in our religious world, where these individuals are confident and have tricked us into believing that the Spirit of God is in them and on them, when the Spirit of God is nowhere near what they're talking about. Because just because someone is confident doesn't mean that they have the fruit of the Spirit. And they stand up, and they sound strong, and they sound bold, and they sound confident, and we think that's what a preacher is supposed to be like. A preacher can be confident and confidently wrong. The fruit of the Spirit, if they are confident and what I see in their life and out of their teaching is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, well then amen to that. But if their voice makes me angry, afraid, fearful, vindictive, indignant, if their voice provokes that sort of reaction in me, guess what? That ain't the fruit I'm looking for. When it comes to the voices you ought to listen to in your life, friends, there's a very simple phrase. Follow the fruit. Don't follow the strength. Don't follow the loudness, the boldness, the confidence. Follow the fruit. Do you see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? I don't care if they say things you love. If they do not have the fruit of the Spirit, then you are listening to the wrong voice. If I go out to that tree and I pull a lemon off and I take a bite of that lemon, you know, cut it in half and just take a bite, there's going to be a reaction. And that reaction is going to be me puckering because it's sour. Because fruit has a certain reaction it is wired to bring. If the voices that you are amplifying give you the wrong reaction, if they pull you away from the fruit of the Spirit, 
My advice, those voices need to be muffled or turned off completely. There's a voice in your life that you should increase. There's a voice that you ought to elevate, and that is the voice that gives you the response that makes you more loving, more joyful, more patient, more kind, more good, more faithful, more gentle, and more self-controlled. Amplify the voices in your life that help you hear and live and listen and look more like the Spirit of God. Turn down, remove, muffle the voices that make you angry, fearful, vindictive. Turn those voices down. Now, why? No, verse 36. Jesus says that our words end up having more power than we think. Now, this whole thing is about speech, right? Because Jesus casts the demon out, and then immediately the talking starts. And Jesus says, hey, look, if you blaspheme the Son of Man, you'll be forgiven. But if you blaspheme the Spirit, you won't. This whole pericope, this whole section of the Bible is about our words, And so Jesus says, look, there is a danger in our words because our words have enormous power. So he says in verse 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for what? For every careless word they speak. See, it's all about speech. Verse 37, for by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Jesus says you can draw people away from the Spirit based on the words that you use. Friends, if you are quenching or grieving the Spirit, you may be bound for an eternity with heaven, just not living in the fullness of God, but you can actually push others away from the Spirit because in your own embittered heart, you're saying things that are a bad voice for their lives. We can push down the effectiveness of the Spirit of God in our own lives through the words that we speak and the words we take in. We grieve and quench the Spirit of God by calling what is evil good and giving space for voices that are not in step with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus wants us to know your words will justify you, your words will condemn you. Now we know this is serious because just two verses earlier in verse 34, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Back to the tree analogy. Now stop thinking about those other voices and think about yourself. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is not just a helpful diagnosis for the other voices in your life. They also diagnose you and me. Am I more loving? Am I more joyful? Am I more peaceful? You see, if I am not seeing those things in me, then I know what is inside of me. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus wants the inside to match the outside. And in fact, he says they already do, people just may be tricked. In other words, you can come to church every Sunday, You can know the words to every song, but you know how I know if your inside and outside match? I just listen to what you say. You start talking, I can find a topic, right? I can find a topic that'll fire you up. And I can listen to the things that you say in that, and I'll either say that that man or woman is walking with Jesus, or that man or woman has a broken spot in their heart. Right? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus says it. Hey, I can tell what kind of tree you are just based on the fruit. And what's the fruit? The fruit is what you say. What you post on Facebook. What you're tweeting. What you're talking about when no one else is around. That's what's really happening inside of you. Jesus wants the supernatural reality of God's spirit working in our hearts to not just change our internal reality, but to pour over into the things we say and the way in which we live. I've reached the point in my life where I am more impressed with consistency than flash. Yeah, in the United States particularly, I think we have a habit of being impressed with young leaders, particularly those who are flashy and confident. And I think in ministry, this is why we've seen many pastors fail over the years. I also think that this is why, personally, we get taken in by many leaders in many other areas because we think if they're that confident and that bold at that young of age, they must be special. But guys, you know, confidence is just the root for con man, right? 
Just because someone is confident doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. Jesus doesn't want us just to have confidence. He wants us to have consistency. And consistency comes when we have real fruit. And real fruit only comes when you walk with the Spirit. So what is Jesus getting at then when he says, by your words you will be justified? Now that word justification, that's that word for righteousness, that you'll be made in right standing before God. This means, in other words, you don't need a purgatory after you die, right? There's no place for your sins to be scrubbed away. You're either in right standing with God because of what God has done in his son Jesus Christ to the cross and the empty tomb, or you're not. So by your words you will be justified. I mean, Paul talks about this, right, in Romans. Paul tells us that you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and if so, you will be saved. But if you're not ready to confess that, to say that, then you don't really believe it. Now, again, we're not talking about fakery. We're not talking about a lie. But do you truly believe in your heart that God became flesh in the person of Jesus, and are you willing to confess it, that Jesus is your Lord? You don't care who wins the White House as much as long as you know that Jesus Christ is reigning on his throne. Are you the person who's willing to confess and say, I know that I have been given new life because Jesus Christ came back from the dead three days later, and that spirit is in me and on me? You see, today, some of us have been hardening our heart against the Lord, or we have been holding the Spirit at a Heisman Trophy-like distance. And we've been doing that because we are afraid of what might happen if we fully surrender to Jesus. But today is a moment of truth for us, because you are hearing that there will come a moment when you can so harden your heart that you will no longer care nor receive the things that Jesus wants to bring. And today is the day when you must say, I'm ready to say yes to Jesus Christ. Today is the day when you must drop down your wall of defense. Today is the day when you say, I am ready to receive this Jesus. And if so, if that is you, if in this day you're ready to say yes to him, then you can do that. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess that Jesus is Lord. Confess that he is here to be the one for you. And if that's you, you can respond in a lot of different ways. If you're watching on the platform, you can press the button that says raise hand. You can drop in the chat that you're ready to follow Jesus and we can follow up with you. You can text, you can text right now. There's a, a cell number you can text in. I'm ready to know Jesus and we wanna come alongside you and follow you. And I don't care which of those ways you respond, but let us know. We wanna come beside you and help you. So today, stop putting up barriers between you and Jesus Christ. Stop hardening your heart to the spirit and say yes. However, some of us in this room are in a totally different place. We have already said yes to Jesus. We've already done it. We've already received him. We've already got the promise and the assurance of eternal life. But some of us have quenched, mocked, and grieved the spirit. We have looked at those who act differently than us, those who we have decided to despise, and in doing so, the Spirit's voice is less and the Spirit's effectiveness is quenched. And today we need to remember our baptism. We need to remember that we were baptized into a new life, that as the pastor dunked us under the waters, he said something like, buried with Christ. You have a life that is in the past and then raised to walk in newness of life. The new life comes not because of rules, but because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And today, the old life through its seductive powers may be calling out to you, come back. But the Spirit of God does not want to cease speaking the Spirit wants to scream into your life and to say, listen to me, follow me, know the new life, know the way, remember your baptism, get up out of the grave of the old life and come back to walking in the life-giving way of Jesus Christ. Amen. And today, if that is you, I challenge you, stop mocking the Spirit, stop grieving the Spirit, stop quenching the Spirit, stop listening to those voices that act confident but do not have the smell of Jesus and start coming back to him. Now this doesn't mean that things will be easy. I'm reminded that the things that God wants to grow, he prunes and he piles on fertilizer, if you know what I mean. 
But I'm also reminded that when he prunes and he piles on the fertilizer, he's loving. And so today, if you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, but the spirit is quiet, I would challenge you, investigate. Why is that the case? How can I get back in line with the spirit? So today, church, we stand at a crossroads where we give amplification to the right voice, muffle the wrong voice, listen to the spirit, push aside those who act like they know what they're talking about but don't have the mark of Jesus. And for those of us who have yet to say yes, will we do so today? Will we respond to him and truly become the one who can be forgiven? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace. God, we thank you for what you're doing. God, that you're working today and that you say controversial, shocking things and that in doing so, we are reminded that we are always able, we're always able to be forgiven if we'll just come back when your spirit calls. God, we love you, we thank you. We pray today that we would receive you. And Lord, I pray for anyone who has yet to say yes, that today would be their day that they respond in grace and in forgiveness. God, we pray these things and we ask in the name of Jesus. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this week's sermon here at Houston Northwest Church. Our vision is to make Houston more like heaven by helping Houstonians like me and you become more like Jesus. Now, if you have any questions about following Jesus or you made a decision today to give your life to him, please let us know. Text Know Jesus to 281-946-6500. Connect with us throughout the week at hnw.org. And again, thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day and we cannot wait to see you again next time. Peace.